Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for our very first virtual workshop of the year. My name is Betty Galanter, and I am the Voter Outreach Manager for Maricopa County Elections Department. And we're so glad that you're here so that we can provide election information directly to you, our Maricopa County voters. Now, as some of you know, we've held virtual workshops and seminars last year, and they were so popular that we decided to host them again this year. Throughout the workshop series, we're going to share various election topics, but this time we're gonna take you into the Maricopa County Tabulation and Election Center so you can see for yourself how Maricopa County processes elections. Now, today's topic is one of great interest, ballot tabulation and security. We're gonna take you into that room, the Ballot Tabulation Center, so you can see for yourself how Maricopa County conducts elections safely, accurately, and securely. But first, I would like to introduce our host for today, who is Scott Jarrett, our co-elections director responsible for in-person voting and tabulation operations. Now, Scott's been with the election department now for four years. Um, he directs all of our department strategies, and he's responsible for the in-person uh, voting and um, all of the operational aspects of conducting elections. He works very closely with the Maricopa County Recorder, Stephen Richard, and he also reports to the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. So let me share my agenda with you first. I'm going to turn it over to Scott. He'll provide some welcome words, and then he's gonna take you straight into that BTC, the Ballot Tabulation Center, where you're going to be able to see how our ballots are tabulated here in Maricopa County. We'll also share with you the server and all the security uh, processes that are involved in tabulating ballots. Then we're going to have a Q&A session. So I would like to remind you that you can submit your questions at any time uh, via the chat function. So submit those questions. We're really gonna try to answer as many questions as possible during our time together. Uh, but we're going to have that Q&A session, which is going to be great. It's going to be moderated by our communications manager, Matt Roberts. And then we'll come back to me. I'll wrap things up and talk about a couple of uh, uh, things to look forward to. So um, with that, I also want to share a few reminders. We want to enhance our time together with you today. So please keep your cameras off. Um, keep your mics on mute. We are recording this because we want to upload this video to YouTube for future viewing later on in about a week from now. And we also today have cart captioning provided by Tracy and we have two American Sign Language interpreters today with us, Amy and Jasmine. So I would like to say thank you so much to Tracy, Amy and Jasmine. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott. And Scott, Thank you, Betty, and welcome. We're thrilled that you've decided to join us for our virtual workshop series to learn more about elections procedures in Maricopa County. I'm Scott Jarrett, one of the co-elections directors for Maricopa County. I've served in this capacity for about four years now. And during that time, I've had many conversations with members of our community, some of our elected representatives, members within the political parties, many of their appointed observers that have come um, to participate in our election cycles, and then even members of my own family. What's come clear to, or become clear to me through those conversations is that their people are more interested than ever in the nuts and bolts in the interworkings of elections administration and procedures. But what has also come clear to me through those conversations, as well as the swirling amount of information on the internet, through social media platforms, as well as conversations within our community, is that it's becoming more and more difficult to determine what election information is accurate and what is not accurate. So that's why we at Maricopa County have decided to implement these virtual, workshop, uh, wor virtual workshops so you can get an inside, um, in-depth look at how we administer elections in your community. And so, and today we're gonna to be covering our ballot tabulation center, which is behind me through these big, large glass windows. But before we enter the tabulation center there, and we provide demonstrations of how some of our equipment works and we highlight some of our security features, 
there's a few concepts that I want to cover. And the first is a word called a control. And what is a control? A control is essentially a check and a balance, or a plural, checks and balances, to ensure that our procedures are working as intended or to identify if they didn't work and why they didn't work. So um, through that control process, usually those controls fall into one of two categories. One would be a preventative or a detective control. So a preventative control is a control that would prevent an action or something from occurring. A detective control would be one that identifies if it didn't work, maybe it was a mistake, um, and when and why it didn't occur. But there's also another concept of layering. So I get questions a lot about why I'm so confident in the elections process. And one of that is because of all the different layers of controls that we implement. So that's if one of our controls, one of those preventative uh, or detective controls didn't work as intended, um, we have uh, other controls implemented that would catch that and still provide for the security and integrity of the process. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and I'll invite you in to our tabulation center. But first, we're actually faced with some of our controls that we're gonna highlight. So every door that leads into our ballot tabulation center is locked, right? And we have this badge access system here. So this is actually serves as a preventive control, right? It's a locked door, only individuals that have authorized access to enter. So if they have a job responsibility or direct oversight within the room, they can enter. But then we have this badge access system that would unlock that door, but it would also then log every time that I entered and when I entered or other staff members. So that's both a preventative and a detective control. But we also have another control is we require a minimum of two individuals to enter the ballot tabulation center at all times. And this does not matter when we're in, whether we're in election or outside of election. So every day of the year, every hour of the day, if we're entering this facility, we require two individuals to go in at a time. Now we do have some of our team members already in to assist with this demonstration. So that's why I'm going ahead and entering, which I do have access. So, and if you can, Follow me in. I'm already starting to see some of the security features that we wanted to highlight. One of the first ones is our security cameras. So if we look up here on the wall, we can see one of the security cameras that we have throughout the facility here at, the, at our central count facility. We have over a hundred different cameras throughout the facility. In our ballot tabulation center, in our secure vault, we have over 10. And many of those are streaming online. So you, members of our community, can watch and see what we're doing. I like to think of this as if you've binge watched all of your, your favorite show on one of your uh, streaming platforms and you re have run out of episodes to watch and you're bored and you're looking for something to do, you can come join us and watch what we're doing. So at Maricopa Vote, and there's an information tab that you can scroll down and see our live video streams. One of the other items we wanted to highlight is are hanging racks, right? So here coming from the ceiling, they're black here. And this identifies that our system is not connected to the internet. It is an isolated, segregated air gap network. And you can see that, and one of the ways you can see that is through this exposed wiring where you can trace each wire from one of our tabulators right to our secure server. Now we'll be going into depth on that later in this tour. So our first stop is going to be right here next to one of our high speed tabulators. And I wanted to highlight for you that well before we even take custody of these machines, election administrators are thinking about the security, reliability and integrity of that equipment long before, right? And that comes through federal and state certification requirements. So in state in Arizona, our state law requires that all ballots be tabulated or counted with equipment, but that equipment needs to go through a federal certification process. So that federal certification process is administered through the US Elections Assistance Commission, and they hire voting system testing laboratories. Those laboratories um, are manned by people that are experts in the field. They know the ins and outs of all of our tabulation equipment, and they put that equipment through rigorous accuracy and security testing before they would authorize and certify it for use. Now, we trust but verify. So in the state of Arizona, we also then require that that equipment go through a separate certification process once it's achieved the federal certification. So they go through another rigorous set of standards 
before it can be implemented at the different local levels. Now we at the county level also do then a trust but verify. So before every election, we perform a logic and accuracy test. And I wanna show you the logic and accuracy test that was completed for the 2022 general election. Now this is the state certification. So if there is a federal contest, a state contest or a legislative contest on the ballot, we were required to obtain state certification or pass a logic and accuracy test administered at the state level an independent entity of the county. And they're testing to make sure that we've programmed our equipment correctly. But we also do our own tests for all the different contests on the ballots, all the different uh, candidates to make sure that if there is a vote, it's gonna accurately tabulate that. So we perform our own, but both tests are on the same day and in partnership with the county political parties. Those parties um, will send representatives to observe our testing requirements. One of the other um, items that we get questioned about is does Arizona and Maricopa County use paper ballots? And we do. Now, this is an example of one of our demo ballots, a famous names ballot. So, and what we use it for is training and demonstrations such as today. But if you are one of uh, our voters that goes to a in-person voting location, right, you might see some of our voters using a touch screen device. So that touchscreen device is available for someone who may have a disability and they need assistance or they don't wanna have assistance as they're completing their ballot. So that, that machine will allow them to complete that ballot using the touchscreen. When they do that, it will print an actual paper ballot that will show them the contest on that ballot, that contest on the ballot um, that they voted before it gets tabulated. So the next item I wanna describe is our chain of custody procedures. So there's lots of questions about our chain of custody. Our chain of custody, um, and we have many different forms throughout the entire election process. These are just two examples of forms that we use within the ballot tabulation center. So the first is our early voting ballot report. This is the report that's filled out by a bipartisan team, a Republican, an independent working together to complete the form. Um, they will, this is what happens when they're separating the green affidavit envelope. So in Maricopa County, when we send out our ballots through the mail, voters return those to us through a green affidavit envelope. That has a specific serial number that's tied to the voter, it can be traced right back to the voter. But once, um, and based on state constitution, every voter is entire, entitled to a secret ballot. So we need to separate that green affidavit envelope from the ballot. At that point in time, we need different chain of custody procedures. That's achieved through this form. So this form will identify the date that that ballot was separated from the envelope. It'll also identify the board, the board members, the bipartisan team, Republican and Democrat working together that separated the ballot, the number of ballots that are gonna go into a tray, the tray number um, right here that is being sent to us, um, and the number that were sent to ballot tabulation. Once we receive this in our tabulation center, we will keep our, cr create another operator log. So this is what we call our blue tabulation operator logs. This you can trace, right? So here we have the train number, 410 gets entered into this area of the log. We the total number of ballots that were sent from the ballot processing boards to the tabulation center. Then our system, because it's an air gap system, has to assign a new batch number. So number one, and then it'll identify the number of ballots that were scanned by our tabulation equipment. And then if there were any ballots that were damaged or needed to be duplicated, they would be identified here as well. So this is how we track those ballots through the entire process. We use red pens. Why do we use red pens? Because our tabulation equipment is not programmed to read red ink. And because we're required to keep all of these different logs, we're filling those out, there is an opportunity that we might drop a pen or make an inadvertent uh, mark on a ballot. Well, that would not matter uh, if we did that because we have a red pen, wouldn't be read by our, our tabulators. So there's an example of a preventative control. So now we're gonna provide a demonstration of our high-speed scanners. So these scanners can tabulate about 8,000 ballots 
um, per hour as described by the manufacturer. However, when we add all of these chain of custody and logging requirements, it's really close to about 4,000 ballots per hour. But we get some questions about some people that think we've double counted ballots. And there's some times where our tabulation equipment won't read a ballot on the first time. Sometimes it could be as simple as a little fold mark, right? When the voter's inserting their ballot back into the envelope, we might have a fold or it could be a tiny little tear. So in this case, that tear is going through a timing mark, so it would require it to be duplicated, or it could be even as it's being fed in automatically through the equipment, it's slightly askew. So we need to rerun those ballots. So we're gonna provide a demonstration. So one of the advantages of this equipment is that it has this double feed tray that can automatically feed the ballots. So that actually speeds up the process. It could allow our operator to when they're running it to start completing some of this paperwork. So here it is running those ballots. You're going to see it change to the second tray and automatically feed. So here we see this. So this machine is smart enough to identify when that ballot was not able to be read on the first try. Right, and it'll actually show us how many ballots we need to count back to find that. So our operator is going to go back and count back those five ballots. None of them have been tabulated at this point in time, and it then allows us to view the image so we can confirm we have the right ballot. So here we have a fold. Right, you can see that image. So that's helping the operator to identify that this is the right ballot. So here they will try to attempt to run this ballot again. So, but they're going to flatten it out, put that back on the tray, and then run this. And this does not mean we've double counted any of these ballots. It's just at helping us investigate and identify why they weren't scanned the first time. All right, so we're going to move on to our second stop of the day. So here is one of our Canon tabulators. We have 12 of these in the ballot tabulation center. And we're going to identify or show and demonstrate how we restrict access to our tabulation equipment. This is for all our high pro and our cannons, and it's through multi-factor authentication. So that's just a fancy way of saying there's multiple layers that would require someone to get access to this equipment. The first is through a security key or security token. These are programs specifically for an election. So right now it's programmed for our demo, our demo ballot or our famous names ballot but this key would not work on any other election. So we're gonna show that being affixed. And then there's a series of passwords that need to be entered, two separate passwords. The first password is going to be um, for the Windows operating system itself. We change this before and after every election. Uh, and then also the next password then will be a separate password, completely different that's tied to the specific election. And that is also changed before every election and um, specific to each tabulator. Now you need all three of these items in order to get access to our tabulation equipment and be able to tabulate ballots. So again, those layers of controls. But we in Maricopa County will not tabulate ballots unless we have political party observers present. And political party observers, these are appointees by the political parties. They tell, they're not our employees. So the political party, the county chairs, tell those observers and those appointees exactly what they want them to do, what they want to look out for, and they'll be present at our voting locations, other areas within processing, but they will also be playing an active role in our tabulation center. Everything from selecting the ballots that are going to be hand counted after the election to verifying that we're not tabulating equipment when they're not present. So one of the ways that they do that is through these logs. So here's an example. This would be an example of the very first log that we would create for the election. And so the Republican and Democrat and Libertarian appointees uh, would be here and together would go to each of our operate, our tabulators and verify that we're starting at zero. So they're completing these logs. They're initialing off that our tabulators are starting at zero. At the end of our morning shift, our our employees would go along with those observers and the observers observers would then fill in how many ballots we tabulated on each of the tabulators for each shift. 
And then they would go through and using their calculators, right? Blue for Democrat, red for Republican. And then they would do that calculation to find out the total number of ballots we tabulated on that shift. And then we'd come back after lunch, again, with the observers, and they'd go through and verify. So here's the end of the shift one, the first tabulator, the starting number on that first tabulator for that afternoon shift. And we'd go through and complete this before we start tabulating on any of our equipment. So those are just a few of the examples, right, that we have of political party observers playing a role in this process. So the one thing I wanted to highlight is when we are in an election, all of this equipment will be running. We'll have upwards of 100 different uh, temporary employees within this department. One of the questions that I do get asked is, well, how do we protect our equipment? Right, you have all of these security controls, you have cameras, you have password requirements on your, your tabulation equipment. But what if someone brought in, snuck in some sort of a device and tried to insert it into one of our tabulators? Well, first we do have um, some private places or cubbies where, where they would store all of their, their items, but we've implemented physical security. And the Department of Homeland Security has designated all tabulation equipment as critical infrastructure. And they've um, told elections departments that we need to um, protect against insider threat. And the, one of the ways we're doing that is with this security container, right? So these keys, we keep them locked in our secure server room, which we'll highlight later. In order to access any of our computer equipment on these tabulators, you need this key and to open. And this is just an example of one of the um, computers that would be inside one of those, this container for our tabulation equipment. And we then would put customized security port blockers in each one of the ports. Here's examples of some of those different security port blockers. They all have unique customized serial numbers on them. And then Maricopa County is the only one that has the key to be able to remove those. It's not a generic port blocker, they're customized for us. I wanted to show you actually their use here on one of our high pro tabulators in a couple of the ports that are exposed. So the next area I'd like to review is electronic adjudication. And lots, we get lots of questions about why we use electronic adjudication. And well, one of the reasons is, is because we need to be able to review a voter's intent. And there are certain situations where as great as our tabulation equipment is, all the certification it goes through, they may not be able to read a ballot and determine its voter intent. And there's really three common scenarios. One is write-in candidates. Our tabulators cannot read handwriting. Another is sometimes a voter doesn't fill in a sufficient amount of the oval, right? So we need to send that to a bipartisan uh, electronic adjudication board. Another reason may be because they filled in more ovals than what they're allowed. And then we want to send those to a bipartisan adjudication board. I mentioned that term bipartisan, right? State law requires that we have um, a Republican Democrat serving as the judges for that adjudication board. And then we need a third member called an inspector. Well, we could hire from a Republican or a Democrat party, state law allows that, but we only hire a independent party not declared or libertarian or potentially a no labels party representative to serve as that tiebreaker or that, that inspector. The other item is lots of robust audit logs within the system. So we're actually gonna demonstrate some of the adjudication actions taking place. So one of the advantages of our tabulation equipment is it will provide a green overlay uh, to show how the tabulator read the ballot. So if there's a green overlay, it's showing that the tabulator is reading a contest or an oval as a vote. But that could be an overvote, which is the case here. So if we look at that red box, right, we're going to highlight that. There's actually, that's a vote for one, a district, so representative district three. There's two ovals, right, filled in there, those two check marks. If we remove that green overlay, you can see the two ovals being filled in. So that would be an overvote, but this needs to be determined by the two individuals, those judges, the Republican Democrats. So they'd go through and they'd talk about that. One thing I also wanted to highlight is the audit mark. If we can show that. 
So when the tabulation equipment reads the ballot, it's going to show exactly how each contest on the ballot was recorded and what would be read into results. And here you can see on that state representative that overvote. So it's seeing it as an overvote. So after it goes through electronic adjudication, it would also then have a additional audit mark added. Um, but we won't be able to show that now because it's not going to be read into results. We'd have to go through all of our manual logging requirements to be able to show that to you. But we're going to go ahead and show how this would be determined. They'd have a conversation. Is that an overvote? And this is another example. So for a write-in write candidate, we have qualified and unqualified are not qualified write-in candidates. A qualified would be someone that submitted their, um, their paperwork before the deadline to be a write-in candidate. So we would enter those into the system and then the board could then award that vote to John Doe. Here we have Mickey Mouse. Oh, well, the system shows the board that it was accepted um, for John Doe. Now, Mickey Mouse, we do actually get a lot of votes for Mickey Mouse, but Mickey Mouse is not a qualified uh, candidate in this election, so they'd then accept it as a non-qualified. That would be read into results as a non-qualified. So as the team performs this, they're completing a manual log of all their actions. And at the end of every shift, we're going to have them review a system-generated log of what was read into results before we actually accept them into results. So this would show, and they review this, and they take this job very important, and they will review this and sometimes spending upwards of an hour to review these logs to make sure that this is accurately reflected here before we accept those ballots into the results. So very critical additional paperwork, audit paperwork, and logging paperwork. So the next area that I'm going to review is actually our secure server room. So this is where all of our information is stored from our election management system. We have two different servers, a primary server and a backup server. There's only a handful of people within the department that have access to this, but none of those people actually have the password to the servers themselves. And for example, I'm one of those individuals that has access to this room. I don't have that password and I don't have the knowledge to even use that equipment. However, we do have IT professionals that are very adept at using that equipment, but none of them have access. So we would require two individuals, me and then an IT professional, to go into this room, and then we'd have to fill out this manual log of the reason we needed to enter that room. Now, one thing we do get questions of, sometimes when someone's standing in this door and we have this door, that second person, they can't be seen on some of our video cameras. So it looks and appears that we only have one person in the room, but actually we have two. And if you just watched a little bit more before and after, you'd see that there's always two people entering the server. So a few other items, we have these color-coded wires, as I mentioned earlier on in the process. So all of these are going directly from the server to one of our pieces of equipment in the room, uh, pieces of equipment in the room. The white wires go to our electronic adjudication station. So we just showed you and demonstrated your electronic adjudication. The blue wires go directly from the server to one of our tab tabulators. And the white wire are the yellow wires go directly from the server to one of our printers. There is another color wire that goes from our primary server to our backup server, and that's a red colored wire. If you're looking in the server. Now, one of the ways we also verify that none of our equipment is connected to the internet is we hire experts, professionals. After the 2020 election, we invited those voting system testing laboratories in to verify that we had set up our equipment correctly and identify if there was any connections to the internet and they found that there were none. I do wanna show you this blue wire. You can trace all the way back to this security canister. So here it goes and you would be able to trace it and the observers that would be in the room would be able to trace it all the way back directly to that server. So I think we just have a few more minutes in the Ballot Tabulation Center before we move on to answering some of your questions, but we wanna make one more stop and that's gonna be our secure um, ballot tabulation vault. So during an election cycle, we store all ballots in this vault. This vault, 
vault also has live video streaming cameras. It has restricted access, but there's another feature within the vault as well, and that's called a dry suppression system. So we're concerned about environmental controls as well. So if there were a fire within the facility, we don't want the water that would come from sprinklers to damage those ballots. So in this vault, we had extinguish the fire through that dry suppression system. So when we store our ballots, we store them in these long-term boxes. We have tamper evident tape that we seal the boxes through, but I wanted to go back to our chain of custody records, right? Those documents that we can trace those ballots all the way through the process. So here's that early voting ballot report. You can see a train number of 455. You can see that there's 200 ballots that were sent to us from that bipartisan processing board when they separated them from the envelope. And then you can see on the actual label where we're gonna store this, here's that train number 455. And then here is batch number 10. So if you go to our blue operator log, 455, batch 10, 200, right? And so you can trace this all the way through to the label. Now we would have this pink portion of the form in this box along with those ballots. The last item I wanted to highlight is now we have recounts that are very prevalent in the state of Arizona. So we then put a label, a recount label, we use the exact same boxes that we use for the original count. And then you would identify even on the recount, the new, all right, the, the, the train number, that 455 that's on this form, the BTC batch number that's on this form, and the number of ballots that were counted through the recount. So you can trace these ballots from the recount all the way back through the entire process until back to where they were first separated, creating that constitutional right of a secret ballot um, for that voter, right? When we take that ballot away out of that green affidavit. Okay, well, I wanna thank you for joining us today in our ballot tabulation center. We're now gonna show you a short video and then I'll be answering some of your questions. Hey everyone, fill the ballot here. In Arizona, voters use paper ballots to cast their votes. The tabulators are the machines that the Maricopa County Elections Department uses to count those ballots. Before and after every election, our tabulation equipment is tested to make sure your vote is accurately counted. After the election, political parties also do a hand count audit of the results. These are the machines that count early and vetted provisional ballots. And these are the machines you see at the voting locations that count election day ballots. None of the tabulation equipment is connected to the internet. You can see the visible wires here that show the tabulation equipment at our headquarters is routed directly to a secure server, not the internet. This secure server is where results are stored. It's behind glass and on display for the public to view. Anyone can log on to maricopa.vote to watch as our team counts ballots. The cameras stream live 24-7. Access to this room is restricted, and only those with a direct job or oversight of tabulation can access the room. While ballots are being counted, political party representatives and observers are watching. If you're voting in person on election day, you'll see when your ballot is counted. These machines only accept election day ballots and cannot read early ballots or provisional ballots. There are security measures in place, including tamper-proof seals, encrypted memory cards, and locks that keep your vote safe and secure. Learn more at BeBalletReady.Vote. See you there. Well, we sure hope that many of the questions that you had prior to today were answered, but we have time now for our Q&A session with Scott and Matt. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Betty. And thanks, Scott. That's a terrific tour of the BTC. One of the questions we saw in the chat was related to ballot duplication and how those are treated and if they're somehow counted again. Or talk to us a little bit about uh, ballot duplication. There might be a small tear in a ballot um, that would require that or not allow that to be tabulated by one of our tabulators. So that would then require it to be duplicated. So similar to electronic adjudication, we hire a bipartisan team a Republican and Democrat, um, and then also an inspector to serve as a duplication board. 
that requires them to duplicate the entire ballot. So we'll keep the original ballot. We'll provide a marrying number or a serial number on that with red ink. Um, and then we will then duplicate that onto a new ballot and have that new serial number um, assigned to it so we can trace those ballots right back together. Um, but then that new ballot will be the ballot that is tabulated and included in our logs. And then after the end of that process, we keep them in two actually separate boxes, but they're easy to identify those two separate boxes. Excellent. We had uh, another question from the chat that's related to what happens when a candidate withdraws before the election itself. Let's say the candidate's name is on the ballot or any type of candidate withdrawal stuff that would occur before we start the election. Well, one of the things that people may not be aware of is we do serve our military and overseas voters. So that means we're mailing out ballots 45 days in advance of an election. So if a candidate withdrew um, right leading up to that 45 days or even after, but their name is already on the ballot, we cannot modify or remove their name from the ballot. However, in many cases, they may announce their withdrawal, but they don't submit the required paperwork to officially withdraw. So there is that distinction there. And they have to do it with the correct filing officer. If they're a federal state legislative candidate, that'd be the secretary of state. If they're one of the local candidates, that would be uh, the county officer in charge of elections, or it could even be the city or town clerk. So another uh, question from the chat is related to the ballots themselves. And Dan is curious, is there any unique identifier on the ballot that would uh, associate the voter with that particular ballot? Well, that's a good question, Dan. And no, there is not, because there's that constitutional right for a voter to have a secret ballot. Now, how we manage that when we're mailing out ballots to a voter is there is a unique serial number on the green affidavit envelope that's assigned that can be traced right back to the voter. But once those ballots come to our bipartisan processing boards, that Republican Democrat, and they're separating that ballot from the envelope, there's no way to tie it back to a specific voter. However, we could have upwards of 18,000 different ballot styles, especially in an August primary election. And we do have a unique identifier down to the precinct because we're statutorily, statutorily required to be able to report results in our canvas at the precinct level. So um, Linda's asking about the tabulators themselves. Who manufactures them? How do we go about getting them? And do we ever consider changing some of our tabulator equipment? Yeah, so our tabulation equipment is um, Dominion. We actually use Democracy Suite 5.5B. And when we go through a competitive procurement process, so that process Right, we need to make sure it's federally certified, it's state certified, it meets all of those security requirements before we would procure it. But yes, after we go through and we contract with, we'll have them for a period of time and then we'll reevaluate. One of the things that we're considering right now is the US elections assistance. I mentioned it earlier on the tour. They've just updated their voting system guidelines. It's voting system guidelines for VVSG 2.0. And there was lots of security enhancements um, that were required out of that. So now the manufacturing companies are implementing those into their tabulation equipment. So when we go out to contract again, we'll go through a, what's called an RFP, a request for a proposal, a competitive bid process, and then we'll evaluate what's on the market at that point in time. So related to ballot security and the security of the BTC itself, Colette is curious as to we have employees and, and politically appointed people that access that during the election. Are there rules related to what you can bring into the BTC with you, a handbag, a purse, a knapsack, and, and how do we manage the security of that related to the things that people might have with them? So when we hire um, our temporary staff, some of those are actually appointed by the political parties as well, as well as the observers we have a known list of who is coming to our tabulation center. So they provide us a list on all of our employees. We perform background checks um, for the political party observers. We verify that they're registered voters, that the county chair has appointed them. We have that, pre, uh, that list with those um, pre-identified individuals. But when they have to come through all of our security, our se 
secure gate outside or secure gate outside this facility. You need to gain access check in at the front desk. They get a badge that's issued to them, so we identify them. Then once they enter our ballot tabulation center, we have those secure cubbies that are separated from them. So when they go and approach our equipment, they can't have any of their personal belongings. Those go into the cubbies, but we want them close by for those individuals. So Pam has a question about provisional ballots. Mm -hmm. What ensures one would be counted or vice versa? What would be a reason a provisional ballot wouldn't be counted? So state law requires, and this is actually um, created from HAVA, the Help America Vote Act, and state law that um, we cannot turn a voter away from a voting location. Um, most of the time, why a voter would receive a provisional ballot is that they're not registered to vote. Maybe they've moved to the state of Arizona um, and they've registered after the, re the voter registration deadline, which in Arizona is 29 days before the election. Or maybe they're too young. Right, they've registered. The state of Arizona does allow someone to register early before they're 18, but they're not 18 by election day. So those individuals will be issued a provisional ballot because um, we want to make sure that we've not made a mistake. We want our voter registration team, which is under the Maricopa County Recorder, to do the research to determine if they should be counted or not. If they did find, oh nope, this person actually did register before the the registration deadline, then they'd notify us that their ballot would count and we'd count that ballot. But when you're voting in person and you receive that provisional ballot, you would get issued a receipt. That receipt has an individual tracking number to the provisional ballot envelope. And that's how you as a provisional voter would know whether your ballot counted or not. Typically, uh, we have a lot of people working within the BTC. How does that process go in terms of people getting selected to work in the BTC or the political parties uh, involved in that? So we've created fantastic partnerships with our county political parties. And so they um, do send us individuals that we will appoint or they will appoint or ask us to hire. So we do have requirements though. They will be shifts. We'll need them to work for many weeks, sometimes certain hours within the days. But as if the political party submitted a name and that individual is able to meet our our requirements, then we will hire them. They will serve in that capacity. But we value right having a bipartisan team, those Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents, Party Not Declared, and no labels now involved in the process. Really, the election process is one of community, right? So we as Maricopa County, we're providing our community, the county, the service of the election. And that's why it's so important to have a perfect cross-section of our community working in the elections department. Well, that's all the time we have for the questions today. For Scott Jarrett, I'm Matt Roberts, and we'll throw it back to Betty. Thanks so much, Scott and Matt, um, and to our viewers for um, being with us here today. We hope that you found your time valuable and that you gained some insights in how Maricopa County conducts elections securely, safely, and accurately. And I'd like to remind you that you can watch this video, which we will upload in about a week, and any of our previous videos um, via YouTube. So you can go to youtube.com backslash Maricopa Vote. And there you'll also be able to see um, our video shorts called Election Connection with our co-election directors, Scott and Ray. I like to call that the Q&A with Scott and Ray, as well as some two-minute or less videos featuring our very own mascot, Fill the ballot. We will have additional workshops. I will send you an email about a month prior uh, to when we are going to host those. And then we have a variety of election education information and resources available to you. Um, please go to our website, election education resources. There you can find everything at elections.maricopa.gov. Um, our Just the Facts newsletter digital newsletter that we send out every single month. It has a plethora of information in an easy to read format. I heavily suggest that you subscribe by going to justthefacts.vote. And then every voter, as a reminder, has a personalized dashboard at theballotready.vote. You can check your voter status. You can download your digital voter ID card if you've misplaced yours. There's just so much that you can do here. So please check it out if you haven't already. 
And then I would like to, you know, thank you again for joining us. We would like to hear from you. So I'm going to send you an online survey card. Please let us know what you thought of this workshop and how we can provide more information to you. I'd like to let you know that our next workshop will be June 21st. Uh, Scott kind of alluded to this, but we're gonna take you into our ballot processing room on June 21st. We are going to be able to see the election equipment, you would encounter in a vote center and all the security features throughout that process. So a special thanks to Scott and Matt. I'd also like to thank our communications director, Megan Gilbertson, who is working hard behind the scenes and all of our election uh, folks that helped to make this workshop available to you. And we look forward to seeing you soon. And with that, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for attending. Bye-bye.